The Lord be with you. Works every time. Um, if you're still eating, please feel free to enjoy the rest of your meal. Go grab another cookie if there are any left. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started with our program tonight. Uh, my name is Sarah Welch, and I am a member of the Adult Formation Commission. And tonight is the first night of a multi-week program um, called Preparing for Your Eternal Life, or Going Out in Style. And tonight and next week, we'll be foc focusing on some legal aspects having to do with dying and preparing for death. Uh, and our speaker tonight is the St. Andrew's parishioner. Yay for that. Um, it is, she is Dr. Ann Woodyard. She has been with Creative Planning Private Wealth Management in Overland Park since 2018 and has been a certified financial planner certificate since 2003. She holds her doctorate in family studies from Kansas State University. I'll forgive her for that. And was a faculty member at the University of Georgia, Go Dogs, and the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, prior to returning to industry. Before entering the financial services field, Anne worked for the IBM Corporation in a variety of locations and capacities. She and her cradle Episcopalian husband, Joe, live in Overland Park with their adorable rescue terrier, Beasley. Thank you for rescuing. And enjoying following K-State sports. Anne was a member of St. Andrews from 1995 to 2004. And she and Joe have been members since 2018. And she will be talking to us tonight about power of attorney and living will. So please welcome Dr. Ann Woodyard. Okay, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Here, oh, look, there's a little basket. I love it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about living wills and powers of attorney, and I'm not sure who chose the order that all of these things are going to be presented to you, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, I think, yeah, Sarah covered most of this. I've been in financial planning for over 20 years. Um, working currently for creative planning, and I think that's all I'm allowed to say about creative. But if you have questions, talk to me. Um, my education, did my undergraduate at K-State, got a master's uh, at uh, University of North Carolina, go Heels, and uh, came back many years later and got my PhD in family studies at K-State. And if you're interested in the tie between family studies and financial planning, we can take that up elsewhere. There is, it's a long story. There's a story that goes better with a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tell people I'm a recovering IBMer. Uh, I worked for IBM, started in Westchester County, and um, was at the branch here for about four years and various other spots. And recovering academic, so I spent some time uh, teaching I, I used to teach estate planning to undergraduates, so explaining the sort of thing to 19-year-olds was, was truly novel. Uh, <laughs> so. um, I'll start with, I know someone's talking about wills and trust, but I, I'll explain you know, why, why bother, why do estate planning? And, and really it, it boils down to, you know, when you're done using your stuff, who uses it next? How is it distributed? And how do we do that efficiently, meaning not costing a lot of money or taking a lot of time, and effectively, which is making sure it ends up where you want it to be? Um, and that's really the essence of estate planning. Um, it, it makes life easier for those who remain. Um, we. We, I get to hear all the horror stories, and we, when you do this a lot, you get a little bit morbid and I'll apologize in advance for that. 
but um, we have a term called cleanup on aisle 706. Um, and form 706, for those know, is the, the form that an estate files with the IRS after someone passes away. Um, so make that as easy as possible for, for your loved ones. I mean, if you, if you love them. If you don't, I suppose you could leave a mess. But um, It also makes, thing e makes things easier for you on your way out. You're, you get to say, you have a say in what happens. The only thing is you have to say it before somebody needs to hear it. And that's, that's a bit of a tricky part of it. <coughs> the basic estate planning documents, wills. Um, anybody here have children? Anybody here own property? Do you have a will? Okay, you should. You absolutely must. In some cases, a trust is a good idea. I'm not going to get into that. Um, I've got it. I don't. I own property. I don't have kids, but I have a trust. Um, just works for my situation. Um, and then the next thing that that gets done for estate planning are powers of attorney. These come in. There are a lot of powers of attorney within legal world, but the ones that are relevant for estate planning are the financial. Power of attorney, durable power of attorney, um, and then for health care. The term living will, it's out there. I don't like it. If I could make it go away, I would. Um, because it's just, it's, the li it, it's deceptive. Um, and we'll get into some of the reasons why that is. A much better thing to have term to use is advanced directive. Um, this was having an advanced directive was the the Labor Day assignment for, for students at the University of Georgia. They had to come back from, from going home with one. That's kind of tiny. Sorry about that. But a power of attorney, it's a legal document. Someone can take it into court and say this is what it says, do that. Um, it requires a principal. That's the person. That's you. You are the principal. You designate an agent to act on your behalf, and you also. And that person has a fiduciary responsibility, which is another legal term, but it means they have to do what you want, and they have to do what's in your best interests. Um, a power of attorney has a limited scope. Okay, you you're telling. The, who, the powers that be, the court, that this person is authorized to do these things for you. And they can't go beyond that. Um, there's a term called powers of appointment. Don't have powers of appointment. That's like giving, then anyway, no, just don't do it. Um, uh, certain powers of attorney have properties. I'll talk about the difference between a durable power of attorney, a temporary power of attorney, and a springing power of attorney, which is kind of entertaining. Um, and a power of attorney must be notarized to be effective. Um, with wills, it's, it depends state by state. There are all sorts of interesting ways, than court cases and uh, law and order episodes that have to do with that. But a power of attorney, you want it notarized. Let's see. Oh, uh, and I think I said earlier that, you know, within an estate plan, it's the financial power of attorney, someone who's designated to make financial decisions on your behalf if you can't, and the health care power of attorney. Um, another example of a non-estate plan related power of attorney would be a real estate power of attorney, right? You're trying to sell a house, but you've moved to another state, so you've got someone who's authorized to do those transactions. But it has the same elements, right? The principal designates an agent who can do certain things on their behalf in certain circumstances. I talked about a financial power of attorney having three, coming in three different flavors. Um, so one is the durable financial power of attorney. That's designating an agent 
who can make decisions on your behalf. Again, they're a fiduciary. If they do something that's, that's wrong, it's on them. You get a court. It's ugly, but um, it happens. So a durable power of attorney is effective now and for the rest of your life. When you're gone, they can't do that anymore. So you need to, that's where the will and the trust come into effect um, because the financial power of attorney, you're gone, it's gone. A temporary power of attorney is, you know, I think we can all guess what that is. Um, I've seen temporary powers of attorney um, be put into place when somebody's going on a long trip far away. The example I use is, you know, you're going on an Antarctic expedition for six months. You're not going to have timely access to the news. You might want someone who can make those decisions for you, pay a few bills, that sort of thing. But when the designated amount of time is up, the power attorney goes away. When you come back and say, this power of attorney goes away, it goes away. So that's the temporary power of attorney. Oh, and interrupt me at any time. I'll just, I'll, I'll rattle on if you, if you let me. Um, again, the springing power of attorney says that if this, these circumstances occur, then this person has the power to make decisions on my behalf. And the one that we most frequently see <coughs> is, is incapacity. So what's incapacity? Well, there's competency, there's capacity, um, but basically incapacity is, is when you, you lose the ability to make decisions in your own best interests. It usually takes two doctors to say this person is incapacitated. Do doctors like to do that? No, they really hate it. Um, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, sometimes people have trouble recognizing incapacity in themselves. So that's why I, I'm not a big fan of springing powers of attorney. Um, you know, hopefully there's somebody in your life who you trust enough that y you, you can give them durable power of attorney. My husband has durable power of attorney for me. I have durable power of attorney for my mother's affair. She's, she's in memory care. My brother and I share that. So you can have two people with power of attorney. It's, um, I've seen it go wrong before. Um, but that's where that fiduciary interest comes into effect. My brother and I really don't like each other very much, but we love our mother. And we want what's best for her, and we want to do what she would want us to do. Yeah, Kathy. Oh. Do the financial and the health care power of attorney have to be the same person? No. Okay. No, and that's a really good question, because you may not want the same person watching your money that that makes your health care decisions. Um, I was, you know, and, and working, with, working with a younger family this week, um, they were having a discussion who they wanted to name in their will as the guardian of their children. And we talked about the concept that the person that you want raising your children and feeding them breakfast may not be the same person that you want <coughs> watching the checkbook. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, and so it works that, yeah, that's not, I'm not a lawyer. Any, how many lawyers here? Okay, I don't want to get in trouble. But they're analogous situations. <clears throat> but thank you for asking that. That's, that's good. So a health care power, power of attorney, it is frequently springing. Um, again, it, when an event happens, such as incapacity, and two doctors will sign off on it. Um, I think that's accurate for Kansas and Missouri. Um, um, you also would name a successor agent. You know, my husband is my, my power of attorney for health care. But what if we get hit by the same bus? You know, who, who is the one that, that makes those decisions then? 
So you need to, to have a successor for that. Um, and a lot of issues under, well, for any power of attorney, it's governed by state law. So who here is Team Kansas? Okay, and who's Team Missouri? Yeah, I have roots in, 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 in both states. So my, my dad was from extreme southwest Missouri, my mom from extreme southeast Kansas, and they're different planets. Uh, yeah. So keeping that in mind, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more um, about that. So again, the living will, is it a legal document? It's signed, it's dated, it's witnessed. Does it stand up in court? Not, not all the time. Something labeled a living will. Um, but that's, this is your chance to um, make an expression of your wishes regarding health care. Do, um, do you want to be given nutrition? if you can't eat it? Do you want to be given hydration if you can't do that yourself? Do you want to be on a respirator? Um, do you want to have experimental um, medical treatment if you're not able to consent yourself? You're able to, to designate all of these things beforehand. And in many states, you can do that with a living will. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, Oh yeah, organ donation can also be covered in, in one of these. Um, so the issue with a living will is in Missouri, okay, any, was anybody around in the late 80s? And remember the Nancy Cruzan case? So this was a young woman who was, she was in a car accident. I think her heart stopped beating for like 40 minutes or something. They revived her. She was in a persistent vegetative state. Um, her parents made the decision to disconnect her from life support, and the state of Missouri said no. Um, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's when we started seeing these things called living wills crop up. Um, you can have a living will in Missouri. I suppose there's value to the paper that it's printed on and written on, but I would not rely on, on a living will. First of all, because, be, because politics, um, you can't refer, you cannot make a reference in a living will in Missouri to artificial nutrition or hydration because that was really the crux of the Cruzan case. Um, so my advice, use what's known as an advanced health care directive. In Kansas, yeah, uh-huh. Could you make an advanced directive that says, if I'm capacitated in Missouri, take me out of the state? Um, well, <laughs> the, the solution is to have an advanced directive. So a living will, which is just sign witness dated, that they will not abide by that. You're asking for trouble. And in the case of an advanced directive, um, they'll listen to you. Um, in Kansas, um, it's okay to have just a document that is written, dated, signed, and witnessed. It does not have to be notarized. Um, it's interesting about the witnesses. The witnesses have to be 18 years of age or older. Uh, they cannot be related to you by blood or marriage. They're not entitled to a piece of your estate. So you don't want anybody who might inherit from you. Um, signing off on, on your living will in Kansas. And it also has to be someone who is not directly responsible for your medical care not someone who's going to have to pay the bills. So, um, and the living will form in Kansas is, it's amorphous. Um, it, it's not, 
anyway, when we talk about advanced directives, okay, they're state specific. They can incorporate a healthcare power of attorney where you name your agent, you name a successor agent, and you say what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of respiration, um, nutrition, hydration, experiment, experimental medical treatments. Um, so it has to be notarized to be effective. And a living will, ideally, you incorporate that into the advance directive. <coughs> and again, that at least has to be witnessed to be effective. So you can have, it's, it's basically a two-part document. One is the healthcare power of attorney, and the other is the directive for healthcare. Questions so far? Okay. Um, let's take a look at, um, you know, once you have the document in place, well, what do you do with it? Well, I mean, you, you can't carry it in your wallet, right? You don't, <laughs> it's going to take up some space in your purse. So the, the best the best way to move forward is to make sure your family knows that you have these documents, that you've signed them, um, and that hopefully they'll respect them. Um, make sure that your, your primary care physician has a copy of them. Um, if you live in a small town where there's one hospital where you're likely to, to, take, to be taken to, um, you can have the, the hospital have one. Frequently, if you have any kind of medical procedure, um, let's just, uh, we're all of a certain age here, let's just say colonoscopy. When you go in, they're going to put you under, which is a good thing. Um, <laughs> but um, before that happens, frequently the provider, the facility, I had mine done at KU, they ask about an advanced directive for healthcare. They ask me where to find it, and then they say, do you mind signing this one, too? Um, and again, it's signed, it's dated, it's witnessed. Uh, also, uh, when you have your estate planning documents drawn up, and you all have or will, your attorney can have a copy of this, and hopefully a family member or a friend who doesn't know where your document document is, knows who your attorney is, and is able to get a copy. There are some states that have a registry for advanced directives for health care. Um, I know Arizona does. Um, I had a, a client who had a child who went to the University of Arizona. And one of the things that all my clients' kids have before they go away to college is they have an advanced directive for health care. Because guess what? They're 18. They're independent persons. They are not your child anymore. And so you want to, you know, cheerful little discussion while, while you're getting bags packed and, and, and picking up bedspreads and stuff is what happens to you if you're in an accident and I'm here and you're there? Um, so it's a, it's a good thing to do. Um, at, at my firm, if somebody's doing estate documents, you know, a full set for the parents, they'll usually throw in for the kids for free because most of them don't need, don't need a full set. They don't need it for, oh, well, they could have a will. They don't need that. What they do need, the first, the first estate planning document that everybody should have is an advanced directive for health care. Um, and I do know that Arizona has a registry. A uh, kid went to the University of Colorado, and um, the university had a, you know, they have their checklist of stuff that you're supposed to do. And they were willing to retain a copy of an advanced directive for health care. Because um, presumably, 
if someone's on an accident that's close enough to campus and they'll know and, and they're, they're able to, to provide that. So I'm a fan of the Advanced Director for Healthcare that incorporates a healthcare power of attorney. You can, I'll, I'll die on that hill. <laughs> but that's something that, that everybody needs to have. Okay, this is bad. Um, so Kansas, God, God love Kansas. They're, the form that they give you is not helpful in actually making decisions. But they do provide this handy flow chart that says if you're between 18 and 64 years of age and you're not seriously ill, you should have a medical durable power of attorney, which is another way of saying a healthcare power of attorney. There's different phrasing all, all over the planet on this. Um, optional is a living will, which again in Kansas is what do you want done in blank space? Um, but if you're seriously ill, they also rep, rec, they're, they're more likely to recommend having the living will, the advanced directive information in place. Um, and they say when you're 65, um, yes, have the medical durable power of attorney, have the living will, and also what's known as a cardiopulmonary resus, anyway, a DNR, okay? I think we've all, yeah, do not resuscitate because if it's not specified in the living will, yeah. Do not resuscitate mm -hmm. if your spouse has already died, but do resuscitate if she hasn't. That's, that's a lawyer question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an attorney, so I will, I will pass on that one. But thank you. Thank you for asking. That's fascinating. Um, another interesting thing about the DNR, um, when my mother originally went into memory care, my brother and I went over the documents, and she did not have a DNR in place. And her provider suggested a DNR, and my brother was reluctant to do this. Like, shouldn't, shouldn't we try? And I said, have you ever seen him, like, do CPR? <laughs> and do you know what that does to a 96-year-old sternum? You know, so that's something to keep in mind, is, is that DNR for somebody who would not tolerate it well. And then, oh, if you're 65 and over and seriously ill, then they uh, recommend medical durable power of attorney, living will, CPR directive, which is the DNR, and something known as medical orders for scope of treatment. A most. Um, my opinion, if their living will form wasn't so lousy, the medical orders for scope of treatment would not be necessary. Um, so if you have a well-crafted, and you work with an attorney who insists that you have a well-crafted living will, advanced directive, um, then really that's what medical orders for scope of treatment comes down to. Okay. Um, there is, and, and I'm gonna, I didn't get handouts for this, but um, there is a place you can go, it's the Kansas, Kansas Department of HE, I don't know. Health, uh, okay, thank you, Health and Environment. Um, that's where you can find this chart and some forms, including what I think is not a very good living will. In Missouri, no flow chart. But a couple of places you can go is the Department of, of um, Mental Health. Um, they, they have a, a, a pretty good chart that explains things to do. Um, and then the Missouri Bar Association actually has a really good advanced health care directive. So if you live in Kansas, 
go to the Missouri website and look at their advance directive <laughs> uh, for a healthcare form and, and that'll give you a, a, an idea of, of how to craft what goes into your living will if, if the attorney assisting you doesn't go through that step. That's something I would recommend. Any questions on that? Again, not trying to pick on any states. They have their strengths. They have their weaknesses. And we all love each other. So HIPAA, anybody know what HIPAA is? Right? It's the thing that you sign every single time you go into get your teeth cleaned. I mean, it's, it's exhausting. Um, what, what it was intended to do was to standardize healthcare information, how it's organized, so that if you do switch insurance companies, if you do switch physicians, then everything that was known before can be transported. That's the portability part of it. But there's also privacy um, protection in there, and it, it might be a little over, over the top. But um, so the idea is to have, in, as part of the other package of documents, and again, a good attorney is going to do this, will include HIPAA documents. So that when you have to go make a decision about somebody and you say, what, what's wrong with them? And the doctor says, that's private, I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> but if you have uh, that HIPAA release document, they can say, here, read this. <laughs> Or this is what is wrong, and these are our alternatives, and these are the um, these are the directions we can go in. So that should be part of any any healthcare power of attorney that is signed. Um, and then some final thoughts, and I've got some after this. It's not about you. A lot of people hate doing this. It's it's hard. It is hard work. You have to think through some things, and they're not pretty. But again, you don't want to be responsible for that cleanup on aisle 706, because nobody likes it. Nobody likes that. Um, so it's for the people you love. Hopefully, there are people you love. And, and that's what makes this so important. Um, something else I thought about when I was driving over here, and, and I don't know, it may be covered by other speakers, but one of the biggest screw-ups I see in estate planning does not have to do with wills or trusts or powers of attorney. It is how beneficiaries are designated on insurance policies and on retirement plans and on, well, g the group insurance that most people get at work. Um, Two, two true stories. Uh, one was, this was, oh gosh, 20 years ago. I don't know. But this guy graduated from college, went to work for Sprint. First day, they make you sign a bunch of stuff, right? And he knew, well, he would save his 10% into the 401k, and there's a life insurance policy. And who did he make beneficiary? Mom. Okay. Who else? Who else would you make the beneficiary of that stuff? It was mommy. Um, so fast forward 25 years. Uh, he's married. He has three kids. He also has a brain tumor and passes away. He had never changed the beneficiaries. So 20-some years of, of, of put, contributing to a 401k. Um, and his mom's the, ben the beneficiary. Well, it turns out she had passed away a couple of years before. So it had to go through probate to her estate. And he had four or five siblings. I can't remember. And it was split amongst his widow with three children. And these four or five siblings. Now, they could have done what's known as disclaiming. They could say, no, uh-uh, not mine. It goes here. Two of them, I don't know the family dynamics. Two of the siblings did not disclaim. So his widow only ended up with two thirds of of what would have you know would have been there, 
because he filled out a form on the first day of work and thought a mom. Which is great. It's just when you get married, you have to change that. Um, also, when you get divorced, you have to change that. So the second story is I got a call from an old high school friend one day. Mm. Hadn't heard from her in years, so I was a little suspicious. <laughs> but anyway, it turns out, you know, she'd had, she, she got married, big wedding, it was cool. Um, yeah, it lasted for three or four years. She remarried. Older guy, um, they, I'm from Wichita, so they worked for, he worked for Boeing, they moved to Seattle. After a few years, that didn't work out. She's back in Wichita, she's done with men, everything's fine. So then I get this phone call. Well, it turns out, while she was married to husband number two, his union implemented a new retirement plan, and he put her name on it. But during the divorce, the divorce attorney, to me, this is negligence, um, didn't bother looking at the beneficiaries or changing that. Um, he had two children from his first marriage. They were grown by then, and he'd remarried. But her name was on the 401k, and she got a bunch of nasty phone calls from lawyers and stuff in Seattle, but her name was on it. And so, and it was about $400,000. And so she, that was hers. Took her parents to Italy. I got a postcard. <laughs> um, so maybe this is going to be covered further into this thing, but as important as a healthcare power of attorney, financial power of attorney are, take time to look at the beneficiaries, especially if you've had a policy for a long time or you've, had life changes um, and encourage those in your family to do the same because do you know what you call HR and say I want to change the beneficiary they send you a docu-sign form <laughs> and you fill it in and push done it's not hard but it is so so important Steve did you have something else So right now we have a, uh, we both have trusts and we have something called a pour over will, something like that. Yeah, I think. Is your switch on? It's on. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you have a pour over will? Yeah. Yeah. But when my first wife died, we had a regular will mm -hmm. and almost everything she left to me except her horse. And so... It was supposed to go to the woman that the horse was originally born to. Mm -hmm. And I called her, and, and she didn't want it. Uh huh. So I leased it out, and then a month later, she changed her mind and wanted it. The horse was now on leash, so I didn't give it to her. Was I wrong? You know, that sounds like a question for an attorney to me. <laughs> <laughs> for everyone's information, we will have an estate attorney here next week to speak for, with us. So if you have legal questions, write them down, hold them for next week. Yeah, Stephen. The clean. Clean up on aisle 706. No, it does not have to be filed for everybody, but for many people it should. Um, you know, it, we know the estate tax. Um, if, your ta if your estate is less than, I can't, 14 million, you're not going to owe taxes on it. So why fill out the form? But for married people, there's this concept of portability um, where my 14 million will get trans, if I die, would be transferred to my husband so that he could not pay taxes on the first 28 million, which is never gonna happen to us in a million years unless we start buying lottery tickets and get really lucky. So the chances of that um, 
happening are, are very slim, but there are there are reasons why, you know, and it's two or three thousand bucks. But if it's a sizable estate or a complicated estate, it's not a horrible idea. But for for most people, we're just extra path. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Now, in her case, yeah. So there would be there would be no need. Now she would still have to file a final. 1040 or, or income tax return. You can't. If she's gone? Yeah. So her estate would. But I'm not legally responsible, am I, for her passing? Um, who's the, were you the executor of her estate? No, she had no will. No will or anything? Was uh -huh. she somebody who, who had to pay income taxes? Did she have enough income? No, she got a refund a little bit. She was in skilled nursing. I just want to make sure that I can't be. Yeah, again, this, that's a lawyer thing. But I do know that, you know, even if you die on January 2nd or 1st, you have to file that final. The IRS wants it sealed. That's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Most things I keep in a safe deposit box. But what's a logical place to keep some of this information um, lo like, I could oh. tell my kids, but then when I tell my kids, they don't want to hear it. So they probably, right. you know. Yeah. Um, that's right. Leaving a copy with your attorney is a good idea if your kids would know um, to contact your attorney. Um, and do, does anybody else have access to your safe deposit box? So that would have to go through probate. So it would be best if I had, say, my eldest son who lives in town mm -hmm. have that. Wouldn't have it? a copy of it. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. That's, that would be my advice. Yeah, because you just don't want to tuck it away in a desk drawer. I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, it, yeah. Unless somebody can put their hands on it and read it and take it to the hospital or to the doctor's office, you know, wherever, and say this is. These are Cindy's wishes. This is what, this is what we must do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if if her son had and a key, then something happened, he could access it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. Without any. But going it would paperwork. be if he, if he, yeah, if his name were on it, then it would also be his. Yeah, he would have access to it, whether or not he would have ownership of the contents inside I don't yeah that's that's getting complicated um, when I frequently ask the difference between wills and trusts again wills are uh, wills fine for most people but if things are complicated um, the other thing I always talk about is I grew up I spent part of my childhood in a very small town um, and we took, there were two, there was a weekly newspaper from Edna and the daily from Coffeeville, and we got them. And um, my grandfather read the legal notices out loud at breakfast because he just needed to know everybody's business. <laughs> <laughs> and when, a, when you die and you have a will, it goes to the probate court, and that's a public record. And my grandfather would have read, read to us about it. But if you have your property in a trust, that does not go to probate or minimizes the amount that goes through probate. Um, and it's not a public, not part of the public record. Now, I don't know if people read legal notices anymore, but yeah, we used to, we used to hear it every morning. Jens, there we go. Um, isn't Coffeeville where the Dalton Gang hideout yeah. is? Uh huh. Okay. Have you been there? Yeah. Is sure. it worth going? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe if I were nine. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> um, the second one is, I had completely forgotten about Nancy Cruzan until you mentioned her name. Do you recall what the outcome of that case was at the Supreme Court level? Because I I don't. Um. I, I, I think the state of Missouri won, um, and I think they moved. The f I don't, I, you know, I, I really, I can't remember. Because Terry Schiavo was the other. 
Right. right. Terry Schiavo, I think, was uh -huh. maybe 10 or 15 years later. Yeah. Uh -huh. After Nancy Cruzan, but I'd completely yeah. forgotten about her. But, you know, with, with certain religious groups, that, that it's, it's a big deal, and that was... That was Terry Schiavo. I mean, that was big in um, those 43's early presidents. Who was and you know, uh huh. It became that one became a very much a political political issue. But I, I don't know. For some reason, I think the Cruzan family eventually got. You know, but by the time it was all decided, you know, she'd been in a persistent vegetative state for seven or eight years. It was really tragic. Um, the other thing that we used to also see in the days before uh, recognition of same-sex marriages would you would have a couple that had been together for years and devoted and knew very ma much how they felt about these things, and someone would be in an accident, and then, but you know, the partner couldn't. Yeah, hadn't had zero zero rights without some sort of. Um, document specifying that this is the person who's in charge of my health care because then the families would come in and do whatever they wanted and that was sad <laughs> so on that note yeah what's a revol in my head is the word revolving trust revolving living trusts revocable what? a revocable living trust Re Re okay revocable uh, revocable okay yeah so, again, I'm not an attorney and someone's going to talk about this next week, but that's kind of, that's, that's, at my company, that's our preferred method of, of organizing an estate. So, think of a trust as a bucket, and you just put all your stuff in the bucket. And there are instructions in the bucket, so that when you pass away, the stuff in the bucket gets where you want it and fairly quickly without having to go to court. So that's the idea. So you have this replicable living trust. You can change your mind. It's replicable. <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> but, but at the moment of your passing, it becomes permanent, right? Because you're the one who can revoke it and you're not there anymore, so you're not going to do it. <laughs> um, and and Steve, you mentioned a pour over will. Yeah, so, so a pour over will, you still, even if you have a trust, you still need a will. And there's a pour over, this thing called a pour over will. And that's basically, you got your bucket, like you have your bucket sitting on a, a, a rug. <laughs> and anything that you haven't put into the bucket, they just kind of scoop it up off the rug. You have to go through probate to do it. They scoop it up off the rug and put it into the bucket for you. So that's the replicable living trust coupled with a pour over will um, is the way my company likes to arrange estates. That's the arrangement we have. That's what my parents had. Um, just it's because it's also private, it's not published in the paper. Or I don't know where they do, you know, who reads the, anybody read legal notices in the paper anymore? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but when you make it, yeah, oh. I was trying, I mean, yeah, again, I'm not an attorney. Um, I, I would also send it to your lawyer, and if it's a substantial change, then you might need an amendment to your trust or a codicil to the will. So. <laughs> I can introduce you to someone. Nobody likes lawyers. <laughs> we have nice lawyers. Right, work. They are a necessary evil, Jerry. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Anne? 
And thank you very, very much. It was very interesting, very helpful.